Thanks, Jonathan. Well, this isn't a debate, but there are some things that I disagree with about what John said. One is telemedicine. As uh, I guess it was Dieter said, we, Canada is a big country, and we can't get people to stroke hospitals in time from a lot of places. And we do telemedicine, and we've done it very well for about seven years, and it works, and it's necessary in big places. Um, and what I'm really going to emphasize is that, that I think there are many opportunities for better care of acute stroke. We've had thrombolysis since 1995 in the NINDS trial, but it's still suboptimal. Um, only about 5% of patients are getting it, and we could do a lot better. I disagree with John in a way that I think it's better to treat people who haven't had a stroke uh, because it's not going to hurt them, except for maybe subarachnoid hemorrhage, which I don't think we miss very often. Um, but it's better to go ahead and treat people in case they might respond than to not treat patients who should have received TPA. I think we should be using estimates of brain at risk from mismatch, either in um, MRI diffusion weighted versus perfusion or CT, uh, which we can do. And I think we're going to be using that to treat patients much farther into the event, including wake-up strokes. And we've seen several times today the slide that shows that the benefit of TPA declines rapidly over time. The problem is that um, if a patient comes to emerge with a severe hemiparesis and the CT is normal, that means uh, that he probably has a large area of brain at risk that's still not dead. And if you did diffusion uh, perfusion mismatch, you'd find a large area of brain at risk that's salvageable. Um, somebody who has a normal CT scan when they present is not going to suffer from TPA. They're not going to have an intracerebral hemorrhage. They're much more likely to benefit. Um, and I think we should be looking at treating patients much farther into the event than three hours or four hours or five hours. If the CT is normal, and we should be looking for a diffusion perfusion mismatch and treating them. Um, the other thing is that we've got to combine thrombolysis with other treatments. This, I, I think, a lot of the failure of the 1,062 uh, or whatever number of papers it was with, with neuroprotective agents was about drug companies wanting to meet the expectations of the FDA for a therapy that was combined, uh, that was compared with placebo, active versus placebo, clean, no interference with other therapies. And the problem is that acute stroke is a cascade. And intervening at one step of the cascade is never going to work. We have to combine thrombolysis with hypothermia, new neuroprotective agents such as NA1, which hasn't been mentioned yet, maybe general anesthesia, maybe other things. And for sure, more patients with severe stroke should be having hemicraniectomy. So the pathophysiology of cerebral ischemia is that we have this penumbra that's got no function, but it's viable because the, the metabolic threshold for infarction hasn't been reached yet. This is brain at risk that's salvageable. The cascade is incredibly complex, and it's really extremely naive to think that we could in intervene at one step of a cascade and make a big difference. And I, I said this in 1982. Um, it's not just the penumbra. What happens um, within the compartment between the falx, the tentorium, and the skull is an area of tissue that self-strangulates because of edema, starting with cytotoxic edema and going on to um, vascular vasogenic edema. The infarction grows and grows and grows because the increased tissue pressure strangulates off the, the, uh, the collateral flow. And that's the problem with this picture. That's the penumbra at a moment in time. But over hours, the, the, the infarct grows and grows and grows. The time to intervene is when there's still a large area of brain at risk that's salvageable. Um, here are the results from the NINDS trial. And they were surprisingly not that much better than this study uh, in stroke 2009 in wake-up strokes that were treated. 
patients who um, were treated with TPA with wake-up strokes didn't do that much worse than the patients in the NINDS trial, and we should be treating more of them. And the, the concept that I think is not sufficiently attended to is this notion that when someone comes in with an occlusion of inter internal carotid, a middle cerebral artery, they may have a severe clinical deficit. But if the CT is normal or the diffusion-perfusion mismatch is large, it means the collateral flow is sustaining that ischemic tissue and it's still viable. But the problem is that the, the collateral collapses over time. And so we need ways to freeze the penumbra. And that's the concept that, that Timmy Ansky has come up with, with this uh, therapy that he calls NA1 now because it's a lot simpler than some of the other choices. It's an inhibitor of postsynaptic density 95 protein. And in animal models, it freezes the penumbra and it works in humans as well. So this was the, the, the trial that was published in Lancet Neurology. In patients who were having catheterizations for treatment of aneurysms, they have a catheter banging around in the aorta, causing emboli into different parts of the brain. So they very often have little infarctions like this. And what they showed in this study was that the, uh, the patients randomized to NA1 had significantly fewer infarctions showing up on their MRI scan than the ones randomized to placebo. When you allow an infarction to go on to swelling that strangulates the penumbra and kills the, the, the viable tissue at risk, um, it's a mistake because hemicraniectomy makes a huge difference. So here's a malignant anterior cerebral infarction in someone whose skull was left on and that swelling tissue simply kills off what's left of the salvageable brain goes across and compresses the other side, and these patients die in about 72 hours. Um, but if you take the lid off and let the brain swell, the patients do amazingly well with, hem with hemicraniectomy. They, the, the results can be absolutely astounding, and we should be doing more of it. And I think my, my hero for this analysis was Werner Hacke, who I suspect was the one who persuaded all these investigators to combine the results of their three studies, um, and showing that the number needed to treat for survival was only two, and for survival with a modified Rankin score below three was only four. Um, and I think what happens in hospitals is we don't move quickly enough because we think it's a terribly drastic thing to take the lid off. The neurosurgeons are reluctant because they say, well, geez, I don't want to keep a patient alive to have a terrible outcome when he could have been better off dead. So we wait too long. And we do the hemicraniectomy when it's too late. It has to be done before the patient is in trouble. When you know the patient is going to be in trouble from the size of the huge infarction at the, at the time of presentation. Um, so I think it's better to treat someone without a stroke than to take the chance of not treating someone with a severe stroke. We're going to be able to treat patients longer using tools like perfusion-diffusion mismatch on either MRI or CT. And I agree with John, CT is more available. Uh, it's, a, it's in virtually every hospital that treats acute strokes, at least in the Western world. And so we should be using CT perfusion more. We need to combine thrombolysis with other treatments like hypothermia, new protective agents, hemicraniectomy, and hemicraniectomy needs to be done much more um, than it is now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh